Thank you very much, Richard. Um, thank you, Esther, for your thoughtful and very insightful Marshall lectures. I have two questions. Uh, my first question is, in yesterday's lecture, you argued that paternalism may form a basis on which we might have freedom over what really matters most in life. In designing and implementing this vision in practice, what do you think would be the key priority areas to focus on? And my second question in the context of today's lecture is I wondered if you could say something more about the mechanisms through which hope fuels aspirations, especially in the context of women's empowerment. Do you think uh, what you consider like a bright outlook, it's all relative to what other people have? Obviously somebody in a rich country, a poor person, you know, his outlook is not that bad. It's just worse than other people's. It might actually be much better than a middle class person in a poor country. So in a way, 
if I need somebody, you know, I can't make everybody equal because I, I think my outlook's bad just because there's somebody with a better outlook. So in that way, how can you make a, you know, a positive outlook for everybody? So I think there is uh, both positive and uh, I think it's true that uh, relative, uh, relative comparisons matter. I think people make this individual comparison all the time. Marcel Fabian has some studies where he shows that even in quite isolated, isolated places, people look at their neighbors to, uh, to find out like, and feel more, they feel unhappy when they are poorer than their neighbors. I think in rich countries, it's really uh, the, the comparison with other people is, and the fact that in particular, that's true particularly in the US, that if you are poor in the US, somehow it's being drilled into you that you must have failed somewhere, contributes to a lot of, uh, of unhappiness and desperation. So I think that relative, the, relative, um, uh, com the, the relative comparison matters. And in that sense, you're saying, well, it's a rat race. But I don't think that's the only thing that matters in that. Um, even if you take the example of the rich countries, for example, the, f uh, the fact that people feel so much poorer than everybody else, I don't think they need, the poor people in the US need to be as rich as even a middle class household to, to feel more empowered. I think they need to just have less of a sense that they are in this complete dead end and nobody is paying any attention to them. And conversely, in, rich com in poor countries, even the richer person in a village in a poor country will still know that they, uh, they are at risk if there, is a, if there is a really bad harvest, for example, and we still hold back and we still try to be quite conservative in what they are doing. So the fact that they are poor in absolute value and that they are subject to shocks that could be devastating in, will, have, will have effects as well, even if they are the richest people around. So I think that although the relative comparisons do matter, there is also an effect of the absolute. Next question, please. Thank you very much. I think it's been a, a beautiful lecture. So thank you. I have two questions. One is about the concept of hope. Um, and I, I think what you propose about basing our research agenda on it is very interesting and promising. But I wonder, I mean, you know, it, it's obviously very much socially constructed. Um, and for those of us that have lived in, uh, for long periods in places like India, you know that attitudes towards uh, personal transformation are very different than they are in the West. Uh, and um, there is some myth about that, but there is some truth to it. You know, it has to do with religion, culture, so the, we're very much uh, the children of enlightenment in terms of thinking that, you know, uh, that we can transform things, that we can achieve things, that we can attain things. And in, in the East, in India, the attitude is different, you know, very much about acceptance so that you can, you know, be born again in something better and so on. So just a, a note of caution that in a research agenda, based on hope, I think you have to keep in mind those things. And the other, my other question is, you know, when you were describing some of the traits of these poor, like absence of infrastructure or hopes, you seem to be describing the uh, mental state of working and middle classes in the West. <laughs> um, so, uh, because that is very much, I think, the state of mind that uh, is increasingly uh, pervasive in uh, working middle classes in developed countries that you know, see the universalization of insecurity around them with uh, welfare states being undermined, definitely the fear of the future and so on. So I wonder if there is a research agenda about the effect of hopelessness um, in, in rich countries because it's true that wealth is relative, but you are seeing, you know, in places like Greece, uh, Spain, even France, people going on strikes for to maintain privileges or rights that they only had 20 years ago, or, or people even committing suicide because they're being, uh, their, their houses being taken away from them. So, so I, I, was, I just found it very interesting that you seem to be describing, in, in thinking about the poor, something that is actually very pervasive now in the West. Thank you. So on the first question, so I guess in this particular sense, I'm really an economist in that I, my view is that one should try to go as far as possible without resorting to culture. 
And uh, that doesn't mean that I don't think culture doesn't matter, but I think that's not, that's really, that, that should, we should, that we should try to abstract from it and as much as possible. Uh, as an intellectual posture position and um, empirical, and, and, and then other things can take, that can take over from us after that. And if you look at, uh, after all the example, uh, I, gave to, I gave a couple of examples from India, the one about the women leaders and aspirations for girls, you know, it took only five to seven years for the gap in the education gap between boys and girls to be reduced by two. So, you know, whatever culture there was there must not have been all that deep. Uh, uh, likewise, uh, the, the BPO revolution with all of this, uh, women started working in the, in the call centers, you see in the Jensen paper, the teenagers responding, or the parents of the teenagers responding immediately. So I think if people see there is, you know, taking for granted all the fatalism that can go in the caste system, etc., if people see that there is something they can do, they are going to do it, it seems to be. So, so it seems there is a bunch of things that could be done in the here and now without touching the, the cultural aspects of things. Um, I very much agree about your, about your second comment, which is more a comment than a question, uh, that touches a little bit upon the, the answer that, that I gave the, the previous gentleman as well, which I, I think that, that some of these topics also uh, have something to do, I think, with the persistence of poverty in, in rich countries. And you're extending that to, you know, maybe the, the going from, you know, shattered middle class to, to being close to, to poverty uh, in, as the welfare protections are being removed. And in fact, I, I, it's not a subject I work on, so I'm you know, not more or less uh, informed than the next person, but just from casual empiricism, I do think that this type of phenomenon have, uh, phenomena, yes, have uh, um, very strong relevance for the persistence of poverty in rich countries, because some of the other mechanism of poverty traps, like not having access to a proper education. Like basically, yeah, there are schools, there is good health care, the food is certainly available plenty. So it's things like that that, that that seems to be holding people back. So I think there would be some to study. And when you read the anthropological at, at account of, of life of poor people in rich countries, like for example, a, a book called A Random Family by Adrienne Leblanc about, about, the, about the Bronx, family in the Bronx, you, you get sense that that's, that's something that's very much present. I, I'm, I think this may be a little bit of a rambling. I, um, I farm in rural Mozambique. I've been farming there for about seven years. Um, we have, um, we're small scale farmers, there's about 200 of us. We work in a valley area where there's about 9,000 families that do the same kind of farming. For the last um, four or five years, we've been hit by cyclones and tropical storms every year. Um, I'm, I'm out of it for two or three months and then I go back and it's the same thing. And, and um, essentially, every year we, we all ask ourselves about this basic package, <laughs> about what's going to get us through. Uh, yet, in the face of all of that, there's little seeds of hope that keep on, that keep on growing. And one of them is, you talk about tap water, <laughs> last year we, we put in piping with some aid program, okay, for 200 houses, and, and, and chlorinated that water, and that made a huge difference to people's lives. And that little bit of seed of hope helped with a whole bunch of other thoughts concerning fertilizer in, in gardens and, and, and in the farms. And um, we started uh, some, <coughs> uh, some arts and crafts programs and so on. It, it's, all, it's all done by very, very small steps. What, what always concerns me is that for every year we make one step fo uh, forward, uh, we, we sometimes fall back two or three steps. It's a really, really difficult, we're bottom line. We're really bottom line when it comes to everything from nutrition, uh, food, housing, and most of our housing is, is made up of local materials. Um, but we, we try to make it work. 
nearly everything that you've touched on, I agree with. And nearly everything that you've talked about in terms of studies are things that, that resonate well with the experience. And, and so I just wanted to thank you for that and share that little bit of experience with you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, firstly, thank you very much for such a good speech. That was really illuminating. Uh, my question is, uh, you've been talking about uh, depression in the context of the developing countries. But looking at the developed countries in the Western world in particular, uh, the reasons why people get depressed are quite different because much is taken for granted. Uh, so if you look at the Netherlands, it's the country with the highest suicide rate in the world, for example. Uh, my question is, has the European market for happiness achieved some sort of Pareto efficiency at which you can only become happier by making someone else depressed? Thank you. Uh, that's a good question, which uh, is unfortunately quite outside my, uh, my sphere of, uh, of competence because I really don't, uh, don't work on this topic uh, for rich countries. But uh, I think that relates a little bit to, to the question I was earlier about the relative statements and to the, the Easterlin paradox and the paradox and things like that, um, where people seem to be on this treadmill where um, they always need to be a little more to, to get richer. One thing that I would say is that Hongazit uh, and another have been using the Gallup poll to look at. Uh, to look at whether uh, people are richer, uh, people in richer countries are happier, and by and large, uh, people in richer countries, m when you're just asking the very question, uh, are you happy, or are you happy on a scale of one to 10, or one to five, I don't know, how happy are you? It lines up quite nicely with GDP per capita, so there is something to be said about more money, actually. I haven't been following the uh, story of microfinance, but my impression was that it was a very expensive way of giving very small sums of money. Uh, and I'd be very interested to hear if there have been larger scale evaluations of whether it is a really effective intervention. Uh, so it is expensive to give money to the poor, uh, or at least to lend money to the poor if you want it back. There's no way around that. Microfinance is an expensive way to do it, as an interest rate are fairly high, but the loans are small, and therefore, like, it, is, it has to cost the money. Like, there is no other way. Uh, so it's not that the microfinance companies are doing it in a bad way. They're doing it, I think, in the most efficient way possible, and even then, it's still expensive. Um, so the interest rate, the, very, the interest rate are roughly proportional uh, to, the, to, to the middle class salary uh, related to the size of the loan. So in, in Mexico, for example, the interest rate could be like 100 or 250% per year, APR, because you need to have middle class loan officers, but the loans that are given are very small, the entry loans that are given. In India, where middle class salaries are lower, the interest rate can be about 25%. Uh, there are, to my knowledge, uh, four uh, largely scale randomized evaluation of the impact of uh, giving microcredit, the standard microcredit group loan microcredit. Uh, one, I don't know the result of, I just know it exists. I haven't looked at them yet, I just got the paper. Uh, the, uh, and then the other three is one in India in urban area, one in Morocco in rural area, one in Mexico in both rural and urban area. Of those three, the results are very consistent across study, which is it has almost no impact in terms of raising the average consumption per capita. It has a tiny effect on the probability to start a business, but almost none. It has uh, no empowerment effect, except the Mexico study that found some maybe glimpse of a woman empowerment effect. People get assets. So in Morocco, where it's rural area, they buy cows. Uh, in India, they buy televisions and cycles and things like that. And they reduce their consumption of temptation goods. 
uh, what they themselves call a temptation goods. And in Morocco, what we also find is that people are less likely to, people expand their own, their own activities, not businesses, but farms and things like that, but then work less outside. So they increase their income from self-generated self activity at the cost of, um, but then they work less outside, so they decrease that income, so the overall income stays the same. So the summary of that is that, and then if you start looking at the heterogeneity, it looks like some household benefit more, and the household which starts poorer, or which starts with low financial literacy, could be hot. So if you summarize all of that, it's not the thing that is going to take people out of poverty. On the other hand, it does what you would expect a financial product to do. This it does help people to trade some of the present for the future. It does help people to get durable goods that they would not otherwise be able to get and to uh, you know, convert this little, little temptation good that they are not so excited about into something they really want, which is the television. So uh, these benefits might not be dent, but they are multiplied by a vast number of people. There are something like 200 million micro clients in the world today. If each of them just has the benefit of buying themselves a television if they want one, and has to you know, cut down on the consumption of ice cream and tea to pay for it, that's still you know, one of the anti-poverty programs that reaches the very, very large number of people, mostly without costing very much money to anyone, because a lot of microfinance institutions are financially sustainable or cost subsidized from richer clients or things like that. So the conclusion from that is, would I spend a, a, tons and tons of millions of dollars to expand microfinance further? Probably not. I think microfinance organizations, a lot of them are able to, you know, should just lend to the poor and uh, uh, as long as it's financially profitable. Uh, would I uh, regulate the microfinance agency to make sure that people do not get loans without knowing what they're getting into? Probably. Uh, would I do what people did in India, which is to kind of savagely shut down the movement, put the credit officers in, in jail, put interest rate ceilings, surely not. much for speaking. Um, I wanted to return to the point you made in the first lecture about Cass Sunstein um, and his ideas for libertarian paternalism, or if such a thing can exist. Um, you said that ideally, and it's just one bullet point, um, there might be democratic approval for a paternalistic bundle. But on the other hand, there's a problem where the, the, aim, the NGOs with an aim to empower are trying to get people involved in parent-teacher organizations who don't have the energy or who have a limited supply of energy and where it's costly to involve them in this way, or it's not truly empowering. But on the other hand, the second lecture about hopelessness suggests that people aren't going to be able to mobilize in a very effective way in order to have some sort of movement to demand this basic bundle from the state. Um, and so are we faced in the end with a sort of chicken and egg problem, and how does this situation differ when you're talking about interventions with conditional cash transfers or an asset cow? Um, from a general problem of demanding resources from the state? Um, so I, I think that's a very good question. Uh, and, and to some extent, there is a chicken and egg problem. And that's why I think the answer, when I'm getting a more fuller answer to the question that Shreya asked before is important. It's like, if we agree on the basic package, we being who, I don't know, governments, you know, maybe like, uh, uh, the governments of the de developing countries, then I think one should go ahead and deliver those packages. And not, without worrying too much about whether there is, you know, getting a vast consultation, getting democratic approvals on all of this. On a big, 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 to get at least some, the basis on which people can slightly relax a little bit and start thinking about the other things and getting excited about the other things and be able to, like, debate and, you know, be involved in their schools or what authorities that, that they would be able to do if they have a little bit mental space. And uh, so yesterday I insisted more on the stress that has to do with dealing all of these things and today a little bit of more of the perspectives that 
uh, if people know that they have brighter perspective, they will also be more excited in doing something that has to do with the, what that has to do with the future. Uh, the, so the, the, the sunshine teller approach of libertarian paternalism, by the way, I think sunshine has gone much further and is willing to, to uh, at least maybe after a stint in government, is willing to drop the libertarian sometimes. Uh, he's written so much about it, so it's not a, it's not a secret that I'm... But the, 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 the idea they had initially is that the ideal way to provide this is provide in a way that people could opt out if they wanted to. And I would be willing to go one step further it's to say, well, if it's difficult to opt out, then one should still do it. And if the only way to make sure that the vast majority of people have clean water is to pipe things and do it for the entire village because uh, if you don't pipe someone in the village, the entire pipe water will be, will be uh, uh, contaminated, then in some cases you shouldn't wait till you have agreement of everyone, you should just go and do it. Even if that means taking money out of the general pool into this project as opposed to doing something else with it. And so that's the part that might be a trifle controversial in that you might not have yet gotten democratic approval for that, but because just getting democratic approval takes so much effort that uh, one has to start something. So for things like that, which have something to do with the basic capabilities of life, then and where the technical solutions exist, and there is no controversy on that, then one might just go ahead, do that, use it as a basis to start discussing the other thing. You discussed yesterday <coughs> that one negative side of paternalism is potentially an encroachment on freedom and you argued against that. I wanted to ask about another negative side of paternalism which is um, the fact that it can lead to the development of an inferiority complex, so, which is something that I've, I've observed. So when I was working in Tanzania I noticed that there's generally a feeling that um, that people in developed countries are somehow superior. And this was reinforced by them watching Premiership football on TV and watching soaps with very good looking people on it. Um, so do you think there's a danger that development work and even the fact that we're sitting here today uh, trying to solve poor people's problems for them creates an inferiority complex which could perhaps even lead to a reduction in hope for um, poor people? Yeah, I think that's a very, that's a very good, that's a very good, that's a very uh, important question to which there is no obvious answer, except that to some extent a lot of people keep solving problems for you that, uh, that you're very happy they're solving for you and that doesn't create an inferiority complex. So people, you know, work, nuclear physicists work on clear, creating nuclear reactors and you, you're feeling fine and they are doing it instead of you are doing it. And uh, uh, doctors are thinking about uh, and are solving your health problem, developing some pills and some tests and things like that and telling you what to do and you don't feel particularly inferior in, in that. So per se the fact that there is expertise and the expertise doesn't lie with us, it might like we lie with other people, per se is not something that is foreign to anybody, it's not foreign to the rich people, it's not foreign to the poor people. Uh, and so there are two uh, things, two ways in which the, the problem is different. One is, as economists, we try to seek to solve the problem of economic agents. And after all, economic agents keep like doing it every day, and therefore they might be just very good at it. And I, I've established these like routines, and and therefore our business might just be to observe them doing that and try to infer from that the law of economics, but maybe we are certainly, we are not in a better position to judge what is good for them than they are. And that's this notion that economists should remain positive and should not run and go into the normative, so should not try and solve people's problems for them because they are good enough to solve their own problem. That's a very, that's a notion that is very, 
that is almost constitutive of modern economics, in particular modern development. If you look at Schulz, which is really the, the, like the father of development economics, his, I think his, his very important contribution was to say, you know, people were saying, you know, idiots, poor people, they're not using fertilizer, they're not using seeds, etc. They really don't understand anything about farming. And he was about to demonstrate, and he really tried to uh, collect data and use data from other people to demonstrate that uh, they are doing the best they can with very limited resources. So that's the poor but efficient hypothesis. Intellectually, it's a very healthy way to approach things. Now, as you may have noticed, I've, I moved from it, and I'm very willing to be normative, and I'm very willing to say uh, people, the, the, the equilibrium in which we are not op, is not optimal and there are things that could be done to make it better and it's possible to intervene, it's possible to have better interventions than the ones that are there already. Why do I think that? Well, I think that as economists, there are actually things we know a little bit better about economic agents. Economic agents do make mistakes, they don't have the entire picture, they don't take into account externalities, they don't have perfect information. The rich people make mistakes, the poor people may be, make mistakes. The reasons why the poor people make more mistakes, we discussed some of them yesterday, in, in part the fact that they, are, they have so many things that they have to deal with. In some ways, they are making decisions, they are putting much more effort in the decision. In some ways, they are making better decisions because the, the stakes are very high. We, we can make mistakes and it's not very bad. But poor poor people and rich people do make mistakes. Um, and therefore, there is scope for intervention, there is scope for expertise, expertise by a range of people, not only, uh, not only economists. The second thing is, of course, what you're saying about rich, the, the expertise coming from the rich countries to be imposed on the poor countries or, or at least shared with the poor countries. I think that's a real problem. It has something to do that there is not enough. Uh, uh, expertise that exists in the poor countries themselves that has something to do with the education outcomes and it will improve. And you know, already in this room there are people from various scholars and if we had done this lecture even 30 years ago, everybody would be a, a white boy to first approximation, not to uh, pick on you. Uh, but they, and this is already very different now. And I, my hope is that uh, you come back in 15 years and there will be more black faces than we see today. And, uh, uh, and therefore this will change. But this won't change overnight and you shouldn't, I think it would be a mistake to say, well, let's, not do, let's do nothing until we have enough experts of the right colors. I think whoever is available needs to kind of work together. I'm, and. I think we are making so many mistakes all the time. It's going back to what the gentleman was saying about his farming project. We're making so many errors all the time that, you know, if you spend in the field, I'm sure you come away from it not feeling particularly superior to anybody there. And therefore, hopefully that means that the people you work with also didn't feel that inferior. So I, I, I think it would indeed be a mistake, and it's a mistake you do see of people going in with their big boots and saying, I know what it is that needs to be done. And people do that from the rich countries. I know because I'm so and so. People do that also from the poor countries where you see a lot of uh, programs being elaborated in the capitals by people who are exactly from the same country, you know, Indian people in India, etc. but have never put their foot on the, on the, on the field and, and develop solutions for problems which are not really the right problem. So that's a problem which exists at all the levels. But I think the solution to that is to spend more time on the field and to be more willing to acknowledge what mistakes we are, we are making as we make them, as opposed to saying we shouldn't do anything because the fact of doing something might hurt. But I think that's a very, that's a question that you need to keep in the corner of your mind, whatever it is you're doing. I think that's a very apt place to uh, stop uh, the Q&A today. Uh, let's thank Esther once again.